uh, Mr. Ibrahim, if you can. That, thank you, very, thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> interesting insight from uh, Gabriel and Apana. Very, very nice listening to the perspective from the soil angle in Kenya and what DFC is doing. So, um, what I'm trying to do here is my approach is to actually connect climate change, food insecurity in Africa, and um, how to develop a bottom-up approach, uh, how to contextualize uh, the way of encouraging adaptation. I'm so happy that the uh, panel mentioned adaptation and mitigation. How do we contextualize adaptation and mitigation through what we call incentives? And I'm going to share this experience from the lens of what, we, what our organization is doing in Nigeria and, and Tanzania. I am privileged to be leading a, an organization called RISE Africa, Africa with a K. And um, we are an agric optimization service provider that's currently uh, working in Tanzania and Nigeria. We actually started in Nigeria and we expanded to the East Coast. And now um, we're about to expand to Rwanda. And then it's a great privilege and honor to be here to share our experience. Like we all know, Agriculture has always been dependent on uh, on the weather. Um, farmers needing a steady mixture of sun, one rains, in order to reliably produce the food that the community and uh, depends on for survival. But this once predictable growing cycle, we were just discussing, like Gabriel mentioned before the start, we were discussing about. Uh, events happening currently in northern Tanzania and in some parts of Kenya. These once predictable growing cycles are at risk from climate change, and smallholder farmers are bearing the most of uh, of the problems. And I want the listeners and the participants to really understand that when we're talking about climate change, in with all due respect, in some other parts of the world, it may not be necessarily connected to the issue of food. Um, but in Africa, all disruptions and interruptions as a result of climate change goes directly to our food system. Um, I don't know if some of the participants know, 80% of the food we eat in Africa comes from smallholder farmers. And when we say smallholder farmer, these are people that are living on less than, most of them are living on less than a dollar a day. These are people that are subsistent farmers. They are struggling to survive. And they farm because they need to eat. So I'm going to come back to this later on. And most of our food is produced by the smallholder farmers. So any disruption in the system of production affects the community. And in general, it affects the society because that's where we get our food. Farmers in sub-Saharan Africa are particularly vulnerable um, because they mostly depend on rain-fed agriculture. Very few African countries or sub-Saharan African countries have cycles twice a year. In Nigeria and Tanzania, it's basically one cycle. Just recently, our governments are now investing in recovering irrigable land so that we can have two cycles. What other economies are doing four, four different cycles? Currently in Nigeria, I'm currently in Nigeria, and where, where Nigeria is going through an unprecedented hike in food prices, mainly as a result of the flood of last year. Last year, 2022, from May to October, Nigeria had an unprecedented flood. It's almost exactly what is happening currently in northern Tanzania. The, the, the ferocity of the rain, the, 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 the uh, I mean, mudslides, destruction, over 8.4 million metric tons of 14 varieties of crops were destroyed. Over 800,000 of hectares of farms and agri structures were destroyed. Like I said, Tanzania is currently going through the same thing. And um, I just read in the news. Um, my team it's currently is currently in in northern Tanzania. We because they started the harvest season yesterday and today we had uh, crisis meetings because they couldn't even access where our machines, our harvesting machines are, uh, because of uh, destruction of a lot of bridges and connections and stuff like that. So these are farmers that, like I said, are already facing serious issues. I, I'm happy that Apana mentioned crop failures and stuff. These are farmers that are facing fundamental 
structural issues from they don't have access to land preparation equipment and they don't have access to even high yielding seeds. Over 80 percent of them do not even plant seeds. They plant grains. For those that do not understand the, the, the relationship between grains and seeds, uh, the, the, the evolution of grain starts from breeder to foundation to certified seeds. Certified seeds are what ordinarily a farmer is supposed to plant that gives birth to grains. In most smallholder farming communities in Africa, they plant grains, first generation grain. Next year, they plant second generation grain until they plant 30th, 40th generation. This comes with a lot of uh, environmental uh, impact. The soil that they normally plant this have, uh, have not been opportune to be regenerated because they don't have access to climate-friendly fertilizers. Forget about even climate-friendly fertilizers. They don't even have access to chemical fertilizers. And when you say a smallholder farmer, that means that farmer is working perennially, continuously on a small portion of land. Maybe he inherited this land from his great-grandparents for over 100 years, maybe one acre or one point something acre. He's been toiling on this land year in, year out. And like I said, if the soil cannot get its food, the soil will not give us our food. Most of the soil in smallholder farming communities in Africa have degenerated as a result of climatic impact. They don't even know what's happening to them. So now to round up everything, I, I was talking about contextualization of our approach. And uh, the other day I was discussing with Kolo, and I think we, we were opportune to attend some programs around Europe. And I'll never forget this experience. I was. I was in one particular masterclass and um, the resource person was talking about cow 2.0. I'm just trying to give an example. Cow 2.0, because in the Western lenses of looking at climate adaptation and mitigation, cows are emitting methane. Fortunately, we had the methane, global methane pledge some few days ago at the COP 20, 28, 28. So the cow is looked at as emission vehicle of methane. So that's why you have a lot of resources being pumped into cow 2.0, meat, non-meat based burgers and stuff like that. So I, I, I was curious and I was asking one of those participants and I, I said, look, you're looking at the cow from a different context. You're looking at the cow as a mission vehicle of methane. While in Africa, this is where contextualization comes into play. In Africa, the typical rural smallholder farmer sees the cow as a tractor. The cow is his tractor. The cow is his um, like bank. The cow is his stock market. The cow is his, is his symbol of, um, of, of, of prestige in the society. The cow is his means of transportation sometimes. So if you're going to come up with a solution and um, contextualization here, and you're trying to address issues like this to a rural smallholder farming community, how do you expect those people to understand what you're talking about that they should do away with their cows because in your own context, you are looking at the cow as a vehicle of emission. In the African smallholder context, the cow is a means of transportation. The cow is his tractor. So unless and until we create a lot of incentives and we invest heavy investment in the infrastructure, I keep on saying this, Africa does not need turnouts. We don't need aids. Africa needs investment in development of the infrastructure of agriculture that will provide access to our smallholder farmers, to all these critical fundamentals that I mentioned, from land preparation equipment to high yielding seeds, to environmentally uh, sensitive, environmentally friendly chemicals, to environmentally friendly fertilizers, to best agronomic practices, to environmentally friendly mechanized harvesting protocols, and then link them up with the market, unless and until we create a system that will provide such incentives, contextualizing it. True incentives. I'll give an example. What we do here in Nigeria, we learned something just a few months ago. We realized this. We realized that we we've been talking about our digital marketing team has been talking about climate smart agri. If you go online or go on LinkedIn, you see a lot of the resources that our digital marketing team bought. It's been dishing out to sensitize the community on the importance of um, um, uh, producing more food, while at the same time being conscious of the environment. We call it. We can produce more with less, less water, less chemicals, less stuff. But if you want to sell this concept to the smallholder farming communities, these are guys that are living on less than a dollar a day. You can't tell them to not to do this without giving them, you can't tell me not to eat pizza if you don't give me an alternative. 
without giving them a solution, without giving them an alternative. So what we did here, we, because we wanted them to adopt our best agronomic practices, climate smart farming techniques, we now introduce a concept whereby we gave them uh, incentives in terms of, okay, the fertilization. Fertilizer constitutes about 75% of the cost of a smallholder farmer. So we, we made them adopt our land preparation equipment uh, protocol. They paid for that. They paid for high yielding seeds. They paid for uh, environmentally friendly chemicals. And we gave them the fertilizers on loan as an incentive. So this is what I mean by incentivizing, contextualizing the incentivization. Don't forget that if we, ca we cannot effectively sell climate smart agriculture as in adaptation and mitigation in Africa without solving the problem of hunger in our continent. According to the UNFAO, one in five Africans, that's over 300 million people, are currently facing severe hunger. This started around 2022, and it has gone right from uh, through COVID, um, powered by COVID, and it's not going, we, we're going to approaching almost about 400 million people around the continent having uh, going through severe hunger. And this is partly as a result of severe disruption in the production cycle due to climate change. Thank you very much, and I'll be very, very willing to take more questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ibrahim. You mentioned that a lot of key things that's related to um, uh, in in Africa, in relating to small um, smallholder farmers. If anyone um, right now we have open um, space for anyone that have questions, they can either unmic uh, themselves and ask um, our speakers questions. Uh, you can also write on the chat and we'll be able to address those questions as well. Thank you. Um, my question is, when we talk about small smallholder farmers, um, and thank you, Mr. Ibrahim, and thank you for the comments in the chat, but I haven't heard any mention of the demographics of these smallholder farmers. We know that much of, many of the smallholder farmers are female-headed households, and we know that they often have access to credit, they have access, you know, in terms of land titling and land tenure. And in the context of climate change, that's going to even be exacerbated when we talk about disaster risk reduction and recovering from the floods and providing the infrastructure or, you know, the question of drought and access, you know, to, um, to irrigation. How are we going to integrate the gender dynamics and the disaster risk reduction dynamics into climate change and agriculture? Thank you. And that's that's a, a wonderful observation. And I think I missed that out. Um, you're, you're very right. The the dynamics of smallholder farming communities in Africa is based and it's basically relying the, uh, on, 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 on the females. And one interesting thing that's happening in Africa in smallholder farming communities, um, the workload of uh, food production, 80% is in the downstream, right? And what we've been trying to do to uh to encourage because a lot of people are concentrating in breaking this the, the ceiling for for women in the production cycle we said that's good because when you go to smallholder farming communities like in nigeria in northern nigeria most of the harvest in the before we brought in our machines most of the harvest 60 percent of manual farm laborers in the harvesting farms are females i'll share a very good example to my with my brother here neil something that's very personal to me i'm a girl that i have five beautiful daughters. My first time in that community, about two years ago, I went to supervise what our people were doing. And I saw eight, 10, 13 year old girls during school days. And I was curious, I asked them, don't you guys go to school? Like, because I know I left my girls in the city going to school. So I was worried. I said, dad, I said, don't you guys go to school? They just laughed at me. I said, school? No. That during harvest season, their parents, because of poverty, because of and, and the demand and the manual nature of agri in smallholder farming communities, they push those girls to serve as laborers in, uh, in farms. I was gutted, and I'm still gutted. I felt, excuse me, uh, I get a little bit, a little bit emotional when I'm talking. Whenever I'm talking about this, I'm sorry about that. I I felt gutted because the difference I have with those girls and my girls is because probably my father gave birth to me in the city. Had it been he gave back to me in that village, my daughters were going to be going through the same thing. So you're very right. Whenever you're coming up with solutions to solve smallholder farming communities, the impact of 
climate change to those smallholder farming communities is impacting over 50% of females because they are the ones that are left in the villages to toil the farms. They are the ones that I met a group of 70 year old ladies in Tanzania, in the southern coast of Tanzania. And I asked them, why are they still toiling to feed themselves? They said most of their kids have left to the cities and they left them with their grandkids. And because they don't own land, you talked about land management, they don't own the land, they have to move very far away from their villages so that they can lease lands and to, to plant rice and to manually. They were thanking us for bringing machines, harvesting machines to those communities because they said with the machines now, they can harvest in a few hours and go back home. And I asked them before the machine, what were you doing? They said they spend weeks. And this brings about issues of rape violation of their of their of their of their persons and a lot of other and it's all attributed to this and uh, issues that um, mr neil uh, carefully mentioned and i'm really really sorry for digressing because it's something you hit the net on the head and i i'm sorry for leaving it out we need to look into the gender equation because when we solve that problem we're also empowering a lot of female folks but young and old, like I gave you the example in Northern Nigeria and Tanzania. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry once again for, for, for being a little bit soft. I, I thank you. It's okay to be a little bit emotional. This is, um, uh, agriculture is emotional um, overall with food security and um, especially when it comes to women uh, and, and girls doing most of the labor work. We also have uh, another question. This is an anonymous question. Um, for for Mr. Maigari. Uh, the question is, can you please speak on uh, your perspective on how the market uh, linkages can be leveraged to enhance resilience for smallholders, especially those in cash crop systems? That's, that's another interesting perspective. I think I mentioned it, but horridly towards the end of my presentation. Uh, I was saying the seven fundamentals that the smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa need for them to scale and for them to, uh, to improve their productivity vis-a-vis -vis the climate ch challenge is to have connection to markets. Um, there's what we call in agri guaranteed offtake. Um, whether you're in crop agri or you're in livestock agri, um, there's nothing as assuring as when you know that the moment you are going to your farm to plant, there's an offtake guaranteed. This is what has helped stabilize the food production system in um the developed countries, Europe and America. A farmer goes to the farm with, with the sure knowledge that X companies require a certain tons of crop from him, of grains from him. So he goes with, with, with research, he goes with data. But in Africa, our farmers go in, like I mentioned earlier, they plant, they go to plant to survive. Survival is the key thing here. So And, and that is why I was very, very particular about um, when we are discussing climate change, for instance, the bigger question is most of the emission is not from Africa. Everybody knows that the percentage of emission. We are not as industrialized as those countries that are making most of the emission. But in terms of impact and how it affects humanity, I mean, in the Alps of Switzerland, it could be the impact. It could be lack of snow during summer, for instance. They used to ski around the Alps during summer, but because of climatic condition, it's as bad as it, it's, I'm not discounting the importance of that. Uh, during uh, summer, now they don't have snow. But in Africa, climate condition means hunger, means drop in, in productivity of our farmers, means disruption in the production cycle. And couple with the fact that they don't even have anywhere to take their crops, back to the question now. So having a linkage and access to market a guaranteed object that if I plant X number of acres and I produce X kg of grains, I have this off taker that has guaranteed to take off my, my grains. So it, it makes me commercial. It gives me perspective. It makes me plan. It makes me go to the farm as a businessman. So I think if I'm, I don't know if I've got the question right, but I think that is what I meant by a proper linkage with the market and with a guaranteed off -take. Thank you. Okay. I have uh, Miss. Uh, Neil, Neil, Neil Boyer, you can go ahead. Thank you. This is uh, to Mr. Magari and also to Apana. And my question is, what model are we looking at moving forward? Because, you know, when we look at 
commercial farming in the West or commercial farming in the U.S., let me state that, which focuses on yield per hectare. And, you know, there's a, this over-reliance on chemical fertilizers. There's an over-reliance on GMO crops, which are dependent upon pesticides, et cetera, Roundup, whatever. And now we're starting to see, you know, farmers in North America as custodians of land, as opposed to just looking at production, which goes into the issue of soil health, et cetera. And usually that's done with small farmers. So I guess what I'm asking is when we're talking about, you know, providing resources to farmer, to farmers, are we looking at the U.S., you know, commercial farming model where you have these mega farms that are driving out small farmers? And if you're driving out small farmers, you know, which means people are migrating from the rural areas to the cities, how does, you know, what is the effect on society, et cetera? So in short, my question is, moving forward in the context of climate change, what kind of farming models are we looking at? Apama, are you going first or should I take it? Oh, please go ahead. Thank you, brother, once again. I think um, in my own perspective, I'm talking about solution in the context of contextualization. The African farmer does not need to migrate to become a big farmer, like in the case of the United States. What the African farmer needs, because we have different different culture, different land ownership system, and um, our farming system here, I don't see it changing in the next 100 years in terms of smallholder orientation. We have um, families that have inherited their farms from generations, right? And I, 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 I'll there a little bit, and, and because of the history of colonialization, right? When the colonial masters took over the con our beautiful continent, they instituted the concept of what we call extractive agriculture, meaning produce and we take resources back to Europe. You remember, I mean, the Industrial Revolution is powered by the, the, the muzzle power of the African farmers. So when independence came, this colonial system of extractive education changed into big corporations multinationals that are buying the food, the, 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 the produce from these smallholder farmers. So there hasn't been any deliberate attempt to now, let's say, domicile processing. That was what I was mentioning that the hard work is in downstream. 80% of the hard work is in downstream. While the wealth of agriculture, it's only 20% is that's in the, in the downstream. 80% of the wealth of agri is in the upstream, meaning in marketing and processing. Let me give you a context. Um, over 70% of the global cocoa production is from West Africa. Ghana, Africa's Ghana and Nigeria produce 80, uh, 70% of the cocoa in, of the world. I did a simple search. In 2021, the entire cocoa export from Africa was around $7.1 million. Compare that with 2022, if you take the 10 top 10 chocolate manufacturing companies in the world, their net sales in 2022 was about $87 million, billion dollars. 7.1 billion, 87.3 billion. This, this is to give you the comparison between the hard work of labor in Africa and uh, the wealth in the upstream. So what we are championing, our, what we are doing with our organization, Rise Africa, is to really share this vision that Africa can actually feed itself and Africa can actually become the food basket of the world on the condition that we invest in the infrastructure of the farmers. We don't need to make them big commercial farmers. No, leave them the way they are, but provide them with land preparation equipment, provide them with apparatus of making, of doing soil analysis. In Africa, nobody tells you that this soil is good for maize as against rice. They just plant without knowing, in, uh, unlike what is happening in the Western world. Before you even plant, you have a soil analyst like Mr. Shaggy, my friend, Mr. Gabriel, that will give you an analysis that this soil is conducive for this crop. Or fertilization, soil-specific fertilization. Nobody tells them that this fertilizer, whether it's organic or chemical, it is conducive for this crop. The same thing with using of the chemicals that they use. They need to have access to environmentally friendly chemicals. And these chemicals 
When you are applying chemicals, you need to understand the relationship between crops and, and chemicals. Chemicals and, and wheat, sorry. Weeds compete for nutrients with your crop. And some of these weeds are complementary to the crop. For instance, rice, this, the, 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 the Azola uh, weed, and 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 other weeds are complementary to the rice crop. Most of our farmers in Africa do not know the difference. They use chemicals that will kill all sort of weeds, hampering the ecology, agroecology. Some of these weeds are actually complementary. And access to best agronomic practices, stuff that we are discussing here. Most of these farmers do not even have access to resources like this to join a webinar like this to understand the impact. Of the climate. We are all elites here, so to say, and we are discussing this big stuff. Most of these farmers in the villages do not even know this. So we need to democratize access to best agronomic practices to, to contextualize it in their own local language for them to understand how impactful the climate is and how impactful some of the things that are doing is it, it's leading to the more climate problems. And then, of course, you need to provide them with mechanized harvesting. 92% of rice farmers in my country, in Nigeria, have a rice with sickle. Mr. Neil, I don't know if you, are, if you can remember sickle now. 92% mm -hmm. of farmers in, in my country caught rice with sickle. One acre of a rice farm takes about 30 people to work for 24 hours in a day, full day, just to do one acre. Our machines that we started deploying are doing that work in 30 minutes. So these are the resources that we're calling. When we say transformation, this is what we mean by transformation. Not that we're going to take them to become big mega farmers. No, bring, give them access, but incentivize it. Bring, come up with modalities, financial, like the DFCs that are here, come up with financial system that will really understand this and incentivize the adoption of this mitigation and adaptation practices. Small scale farmers, particularly in the villages, they don't have the opportunities like we have now uh, discussing this. Uh, so I think um, this is something that, you know, we can find ways uh, to provide these resources to those communities. And uh, I hope for better successful for small scale farmers in Africa.